Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Karen Lindell, and I'm an attorney at Juvenile Law Center. Um, before we launch into the content, I'm going to run through a few tech items, and the first one is I want to make sure that you all can hear me. So can someone please make use of the question box, and I'll cover where that is in just a moment um, for those who don't, but someone who already knows, can someone chat in to indicate that you are able to hear me, please? Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so a few tech overview things. Um, you're all um, hopefully logged into the webinar and you're able to connect um, only the, you're, you're able to connect with audio, um, but you're all in listen only mode, which means you're not able to communicate with us via the webinar software, but hopefully you'll be able to hear us through the webinar software. Um, if you have any tech related concerns or questions, um, please feel free to use the question box to let us know about those. Um, you should see that on the control panel, which is the um, sidebar that should be on your screen right now. There's one drop down menu, you might have to expand it for either questions or chat. Either one of those, if you type something in there, will be received by the organizers and will be able to, to, to helpfully troubleshoot your issue. Um, you should also, in that dashboard, be able to see um, the audio controls, so connecting either via your phone or via the computer, um, either are options, um, as well as the list of attendees, and um, later in the webinar there are a few polls that will pop up um, using that sidebar menu. Um, you should also be able to see the first page right now of the PowerPoint presentation. If you are not able to see that, if you're not um, viewing um, a PowerPoint slide that says achieving the least restrictive setting in the child welfare system, please do let me know that, but hopefully that will be on everyone's screen. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and we'll post it after, the, after um, it concludes, so in case um, that was a question anyone had, um, we will have a recording available. Um, so with those notes, if there's no tech-related questions, I'm going to go ahead and start our presentation for today. Um, so this webinar, as I mentioned, is entitled Achieving the Least Restrictive Setting in the Child Welfare System, and specifically how child welfare advocacy can strengthen Olmstead work and protect vulnerable youth. Um, and this webinar is the third in a four-part series um, hosted, by, um, hosted by Juvenile Law Center with support from the National Disability Rights Network. Um, and the aim of this series, um, sorry, my PowerPoint going here. The aim of this series is really to, to facilitate collaboration um, between child welfare stakeholders and advocates um, and PNA advocates and other disability advocates so that we um, are able to learn from each other. So PNA advocates have um, are equipped with knowledge of child welfare law and policy to assist them in their advocacy for youth with disabilities um, and to promote collaborations more generally um, on, on issues related to youth with disabilities who are in the child welfare system. Um, and so we've already we've had two of the webinars so far, and those are both, um, we've recorded them, and um, the links to those can be made available. And we do have one more coming up, which I believe is going to be on July 11th, um, and that will be on connecting to adult serving systems, um, so after our kids are leaving the child welfare system. So we hope you'll join that for the, those as well. Um, today's presenters, I have with, so as I mentioned, I'm Karen Lindell, and I'm a staff attorney at Juvenile Law Center. I also have with me Jennifer Pokipner, who's the Child Welfare Policy Director at Juvenile Law Center, and Rachel Mann, who's a senior staff attorney at Disability Rights Pennsylvania. Um, and so today we'll be um, talking about how to achieve the least restrictive setting, get children who are child welfare involved um, and have disability needs in um, community placements with families outside of institutional settings. And we're going to do that really by walking through two case examples. So there's not going to be a lot of introductory matter here. We're kind of going to launch in to talking through two cases. And I'm going to be drawing on my two experts here with me to um, answer a lot of questions about how um, they might um, troubleshoot and work through the sort of challenges of these two respective cases. And as you can see from this agenda, um, they're, um, they're both going to be older youth cases, but they're going to raise slightly different concerns. And we'll be covering kind of three general um, components, I guess, to each of these case examples. One is the legal framework that you, that you might use to think about um, the case examples and really highlighting some areas of child welfare law that um, overlap and are, um, that can, can help um, facilitate your advocacy using disability provisions that you might be more familiar with. Um, we'll talk about the specific supports and what, um, how, how the application of that law might look in these individual cases. And we'll talk specifically about the nuts and bolts of how a PNA might get involved in each of those cases. And then at the end, we'll spend a few minutes talking about some systemic reform um, efforts and then some takeaways. So before we launch in, I do have a little bit of an overview. And I'm going to start by making sure that we have everybody using your control panel effectively and um, <laughs> engaged in starting to think about these issues. 
So a question for you, which I'm going to launch as a poll in just a minute, is whether you have ever had a client or someone that you've worked with, if not a client in the formal sense, um, you know, a young person that you um, knew of or been involved with at all, who is child welfare involved, and these are, this is not mutually exclusive list, any of these could be applicable, but was placed in a congregate care setting unnecessarily because of disability needs, perhaps remained in congregate care for longer than otherwise necessary um, because of disability needs or perhaps because of child welfare shortcomings, um, struggled to find a family-based placement because of disability needs, or struggled to achieve permanency because of disability needs. So I'm going to launch that poll and see what you guys, what your experience has been. So take a few minutes. Hopefully that's now visible on your screen. So I'm going to leave it open for a few minutes, and then we'll see what folks think. All right, looks like just about everybody has chimed in, so I'm going to close the poll and then share it with you guys. And this is probably unsurprising, but it looks like everybody who has voted has said that all of these have been issues you've experienced, um, which is unfortunate but not surprising. Um, and so uh, thank you for sharing that, and hopefully we'll dive in a little bit um, to how to address some of these concerns. Um, okay, let me hide the poll results now. Okay. Okay, so before, so as as is indicated by by your responses to the survey, this is a common problem. We see a lot of young people in the child welfare system who spend time in institutional settings. Um, this slide demonstrates that there has been a lot of attention focused on this in the child welfare realm. Um, so these are all di different reports or studies um, that have been highlighting the overuse potentially of congregate care and efforts to reduce it. Um, but I want to really call attention to a big gap sometimes in the child welfare system's approach to congregate care reduction efforts, which is that far too often young people with disabilities or with special health care needs are left out for one reason or another in some of these efforts. And um, there's a lot of contributing factors to that. This first, the infographic that you're seeing on this slide, I don't mean in any way to, to single out an organization or one of those prior reports, but this is from one of those reports that's highlighting that um, you know, four in ten children in group placements have no mental health diagnosis, medical disability, or behavioral health problem that might warrant such a restrictive setting. The faulty presumption that you see really demonstrated there, I think, is very common in child welfare, which is the idea that there might be some kids who do need that setting, or that kids with disabilities um, should be in such a setting, or, or, or at least are more likely to require that than kids without disabilities. And when you come in with that presumption, that means that group of children is far more likely to, to sort of not see the benefits of some of these um, reduction of congregate care efforts. Also, you know, as you're trying to reduce congregate care on a systems level, you know, it might be that some of the children who have lower needs are easier to move out, which would be within a much higher needs population um, in some of these institutional settings. Um, also, a few other things to highlight just that, that you know, the child welfare system is designed with a number of goals in mind. Um, safety, permanency, and well-being um, are those that are, you know, embedded in, in the legal framework. Um, and safety sometimes can become the overarching one that kind of can blind the systems to some of the other needs as well. And, you know, kids with disability needs are sometimes viewed as having such prominent safety concerns that they, that they can't be, that there's fear of, of transitioning them into the community. And we need to kind of get past that and give people tools to be able to see past that. Um, and then some financial realities of the, the, these resource um, scarce systems that might not have available beds or might not have services in their array that, that can help facilitate these things. But the result of all that is that we know that older youth and youth with disabilities are at a far higher risk of being placed in congregate care and staying there for a long period of time than their non-disabled peers. And of course, this leads to, to, to poor outcomes for these young people. As we know, it's bad developmentally. All children do better in families, and that's true for children of all ages. Um, everyone needs a family, um, and that it's associated with worse services, oftentimes the quality of the education or the training or the independent living skills that are provided in um, these, these congregate care settings are not the same caliber as those that you might find in the community. There are fewer opportunities to develop um, the sort of support network through your exposure to a community um, that, has, that represents a cross-section of the population. Um, so you might, you know, it's harder for these young people to develop the types of relationships that could, be, could provide permanency for them and, and could provide support into adulthood. Um, and of course, we know that as a, on the systems level that ultimately institutionalizing these children for long periods of time is not the cost-effective way of, of providing for their care. 
So today, our hope is to tackle some of these issues um, through by understanding the legal framework, um, identifying alternatives to institutional placements in the context of these case examples, um, and um, what resources might make them possible, and then to learn some advocacy tips. And we hope to learn some of those from you as well. So we will be calling on you guys to participate at various points in this um, through some polls and also just through some chatting in questions um, and or comments. Um, so please uh, please do share what you your, your understanding and your questions and your ideas with us throughout. So with all of that, I'm going to start um, with our first case example. Um, so Monique. Monique is a 14-year-old. Oh, and I, before I before I begin, I should mention that these these case examples, although we've adapted facts and changed names for anonymity, are grounded very much in real examples we've worked with. So these these are these are real cases. Um, so Monique is a 14-year-old with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, she requires a wheelchair, sometimes has seizures, and she needs a ventilator at night. But she has no cognitive or developmental limitations. Monique was previously living with her grandmother, um, who had been trained to provide for her medical needs. But the grandmother passed away two years ago, and at that point, Monique was placed in the child welfare system. Since then, she's bounced around among various institutional placements, and she's currently in, a, in an institution for older teens and young adults who have serious developmental limitations, most of whom are nonverbal. She's very unhappy in this placement, and very much misses living with her grandmother in the community. Um, she's very close to her aunt and uncle, and they are interested in having her live with them, but they feel overwhelmed by her medical needs, and their house is not wheelchair accessible. So before I turn over to our experts for some ideas, I would like to ask you guys what concerns, what are the things that really pop out to you about Monique's situation? What is, what's top of your list of concerns? And what questions might you ask? Like what, what more do you want to know um, to figure out what might be done to improve Monique's situation? So just use your question or your chat box and, and chime in if there's, if there's things that um, you, know, you, you find particularly alarming or concerning. And um, any and all ideas are welcome. I'm going to click back to Monique's fact pattern here in case I read that quickly and um, people might want to be thinking a little bit more. OK, I see some coming in now. Um, so there's a concern that Monique is inappropriately placed. Mm -hmm. so thoughts about making the, um, the home wheelchair accessible, training the aunt and uncle on her medical needs. That sounds like another concern regarding her placement and how to get her in a different alternative reasonable accommodations provided to the aunt and uncle. Yeah, so those are all, I think, things that jump out to me as well. And so we're going to talk through that in a little bit more depth um, with our two experts. So I'm going to turn first to Rachel um, and ask, what are the main disability law issues that you see in Monique's case? So first, sort of focusing on the problems, many of which were just named by people on the phone. Um, a placement that may be based on assumptions that institutional care is necessary, um, a lack of adequate support for families, as somebody was talking about, the home accessibility training for families and so forth. Um, if that family, aunt and uncle, are not able to do it for whatever reason, the lack of accessible foster homes and lack of foster homes that are supported to, prov to provide the particular care that uh, Monique would need, the failure to coordinate with other systems like Medicaid and not in Monique's staff. In the, the ID system in many cases, not in Monique's case. Um, but as there are many things that we'll talk about later and which um, you may well know, that Medicaid could provide that um, they haven't tapped into. Uh, and there may be policies about licensing or funding rules that are, that are creating barriers. Um, or there may be policies that should be in place and aren't like how to make Medicaid requests and how to file appeals um, and so forth. Um, with respect to the law that applies, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail on this because I assume that, that you folks are familiar with most of this stuff, but I just highlighted a couple of regulatory provisions applicable to Title II of the ADA, which would be similar in 504, um, the requirement that services be provided in the most integrated setting, the denial of services or equal services or equally effective services or all the different ways that that's stated, um, the failure to modify policies and practices, 
um, and contracting with other agencies that discriminate, like foster care agencies or uh, facilities. Um, and then, as I said, the, the Medicaid entitlements and waivers are, are another area of law that provides a lot of um, support that we'll talk about more later. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, and so now a similar question to put to Jenny here um, about whether there's any possible child welfare law violations um, presented by Monique's situation. Thanks. So in this case, um, Monique came into care from her grandparents who passed away. Um, so in this case, she was being removed from a home that she wouldn't be going back home to because, because they were deceased. But under the federal law, the Child Welfare Agency does have an obligation to make reasonable efforts to prevent removal and then return a child home. So we just wanted to highlight that for you guys. If this removal had been to grandparents who potentially something happened in the home and maybe um, they needed repairs, that, that that reasonable efforts requirement is there. In this case, where you're removed from a situation where you, you couldn't return, um, there's still this reasonable efforts requirement in the law about finding um, permanency and family for a young person, which we're going to talk about in more detail in a little bit. But basically, the, um, the federal law will, is telling the states, if they're receiving these child welfare funds, which all states are, that they need to be making reasonable efforts to get kids into families. And the, that term reasonable efforts, like a lot of our legal terms, is not necessarily self-explanatory, and the federal law doesn't define it. But what I can tell you all is that some states have defined it more specifically, and so definitely check in your jurisdiction if you have some case law on it. But if you're in a state like many of us um, in our state, Pennsylvania, which doesn't have very specific law and definitions, what we do at least have is that that term is, is supposed to be individualized. So what is reasonable efforts for one young person and family is different than for another. So Monique's specific needs and the needs of people who would be caring for her, those are very relevant to deciding what are reasonable efforts. Um, and so that's just one of those vehicles or tools you can use to get um, the agency to pay more attention to Oni, to look for family for her, look for services. And we did want to add in this slide that this reasonable efforts um, requirement is important under the law um, for various reasons. It's a, it's a legal tool, something you can invoke, but it is also something that um, advocates in child welfare courts and dependency courts, um, if, if something isn't happening, if they can say the agency isn't making reasonable efforts, that finding by the court and no reasonable efforts finding threatens the child welfare agency's federal funds. So we just wanted to underline that to show that it can be a legal um, tool that can have a lot of consequences for a child welfare agency and can sometimes make them move. And, and, and make more efforts and provide more services. Similar to um, the ADA and Rehabilitation Act, the child welfare law contains an um, obligation to provide you the least restrictive, most family-like placement setting. And so in Monique's case, as Rachel mentioned, I mean, they jumped right to institutional care. There was no attempt at less restriction. And so that would jump out to me as, as something that um, is potentially violating the federal law. And then we'll, we will talk about this in more detail as we go through the case examples, but throughout federal child welfare law and then in the majority of our state laws, there's going to be these obligations not just to place kids in the least restrictive setting, but also to provide appropriate services to meet their health, but also just their daily living needs, and, um, and also the preference to provide all these services in the community setting. So again, we're going to have a federal law base to this, but all of your states are going to have kind of parallel laws, and some are going to be better than others, and so they're worth looking at to see if they provide you language or tools that can help you with your advocacy. I see one question that maybe we'll try to take now, just about um, what federal law requires the least restrictive placement. Um, so the, the federal child welfare law, and I believe um, we might have not put the citation there, did we? We can, uh, we can, send, on the we can send you all the citation, but um, Title 4E of the Social Security Act is where the bulk of our child welfare law is, and there's one section, and that's 42 USC, um, there's one section that is Section 675 
that has a lot of the requirements um, about case planning and case review, and that is where um, a lot of these requirements about least restriction. But we can definitely, for everyone who's registered, send you all the citations um, if we don't have them in the slide. So thanks for pointing that out, and I'm sorry that um, I didn't put the citation on the slide. But our child welfare law, federal child welfare law, is Title IV-E um, of the Social Security Act, again, 42 USC. It starts at around six. Section 670, and most of the provisions we use are 670 to 677. But we'll send you all citations. Yes, I, I will send that. Apologies for not including that. A great question. Um, okay, so that's a great legal background. So we're going to now try to put this even in more concrete practice for Monique. Um, so some of this you guys already were starting to think about, but this is a question for you again of sort of what specifically, what, what alternatives, we've got concerns about Monique's placement. It seems inappropriate. Um, she's surrounded by people who have very different needs than she does, she, and um, she's not in a community setting, and there doesn't seem to be a plan right now for getting her home or getting her to an alternative. So what what are those alternatives? And I know we've mentioned the aunt and uncle, but let's think even a little bit more broadly of where where might Monique do better than her current than in her current placement? Um, what ideas would you guys like to pursue? Perhaps one way to frame this might be to say, what if the aunt and uncle weren't an, okay, great, we got some coming in now. But if, if other than, if their aunt and uncle weren't an option, what might be on your radar? So I see a Medicaid waiver program, specially trained family foster care. Great. Um, and we'll be talking about both of those in more depth. Those were top of our list too, I think. So thanks for sharing those. So, um, and th these will, um, we'll be talking about some specific placement ideas, but we want to first start by talking about um, the supports that might make them possible. Um, so I'm going to turn to Rachel for this question about what supports outside of the child welfare system, and we will talk about those in the system as well, but might make an alternative arrangement possible. So I do want to start first with the aunt and uncle before we absolutely yeah, move yeah. on to anyone else, because that certainly would be, um, uh, assuming Monique is, is happy with that situation, the, the first option. Um, and clearly, the aunt and uncle need supports to make that work. Uh, the, the most obvious uh, place to get those supports is the Medicaid program, the EPSDT program that provides uh, medically necessary services for kids. Through that program, and again, I apologize if you all know all this stuff, but um, we don't actually know who's listening. So. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, she would need uh, shift nursing and personal care aids, likely. Um, at, certainly, at least when her parent, when her aunt and uncle are, are working or sleeping or not available or able to do it, um, they might need training before they're able to do it. So she might need more aids the first month while the, the aunt and uncle learn learn what to do. Um, and then under general Medicaid rules, at least in Pennsylvania, and I think this is true for the most part in other states, um, they would be asked to do what they can, um, and EPSDT Medicaid would, would pay for the rest. Um, she doesn't particularly need behavioral aid, but I just wanted to point that out because that is also um, something that's available that many kids do need in home or in school behavioral aids, which should also be available. Um, and in her case, and this is, I wanted to point this out because this is an area of law that is changing, I think, I hope. Um, sh their home is not accessible. That could mean many things. Uh, it could be that a doorway is too narrow. It could be that there are steps. It could be any number of things. Um, we actually at Disability Rights Pennsylvania are in the middle of litigation right now about the extent to which um, Medicaid's EPSDT program covers equipment like wheelchair lifts that would um, uh, get Monique up the steps um, or stair glides or, uh, or portable ramps or other kinds of ramps um, because the, the, uh, there are new regulations that were just issued in last July, which I've cited there, that define equipment 
um, that seem to me to clearly cover all those kinds of items. And um, I know in Pennsylvania, at least, at least, and I suspect other places, that they are not currently considered Medicaid-covered items, wheelchair lifts and so forth, van lifts, um, all of those kinds of items. So we'll see where that goes. We just did have the state approve a, a stair glide, an indoor stair glide for our client, um, but not an outdoor uh, wheelchair lift, which we are, as I say, in federal court about right now. Um, other home modifications, though, like widened doorways, um, you know, bigger bathrooms, things that, that are not equipment by any definition, um, are not covered through the regular Medicaid program, um, which brings us to uh, waivers. As somebody mentioned, called in. Um, and as you probably all know, um, waivers are basically services that um, are given that are not otherwise covered, you can get waiver services to avoid institutionalization. Um, and every state is different about what waivers they have. So interestingly, Pennsylvania has no waiver that would cover Monique because Pennsylvania has a waiver for people of all ages with intellectual disabilities or autism. Um, and it has waivers for people with physical disabilities who are 18 or over. But it has no waiver for children who have uh, only physical disabilities, medical disabilities. So that's something, when we talk about systemic change issues, that's something that that, that we are working on um, to do. But if you do have a waiver available, you have to use your Medicaid funds first. Um, so you have to need at least one service beyond support coordination that wouldn't be covered by Medicaid otherwise. Um, and in Pennsylvania, that's usually home and vehicle modifications, like I just described, particularly widening doorways and that sort of thing. Um, respite services, which would help this aunt and uncle if they're, if they're home and able to provide the care, but they can't do it every minute. They need sometimes to have time for other family members and for themselves. Um, respite services can be available through a waiver, but not through regular Medicaid. Um, our waivers also cover, in some cases, life-sharing homes. Um, the room and board is not something that is paid for by the federal federal share, um, but it can be paid for by the child welfare system. It can be paid for by uh, other state dollars um, or even just uh, SSI checks at times. Uh, so that is another service that um, we are really trying to help make sure that kids have access to when they can't live with, um, with their original family. One comment that's related that we just got um, from a uh, participant is that they, um, in Virginia, were able to get some bathroom modifications for a child through EDSCT because it was part of her independent toileting slash showering therapy plan. Um, and that might be a, a unicorn is the comment, but it was a surprising <laughs> win for us. And thank you yeah. for sharing that. That's great. I'm um, very impressed. <laughs> and actually, if you have any information about that that you can forward on, I'd love to have it. Um, and one thing that I think will come up later as well, but um, that can be a complication, is securing waiver services for young people who are child welfare involved. We know that um, that often here in Pennsylvania, at least, there's sort of an, there's an, as Jenny will talk about, there's an obligation to the child welfare system to provide for these kids, but that sometimes can then mean that they're um, either deprioritized or just simply not considered for um, for waiver services while they're in care. Uh, yes, because the state would likely say that the child welfare system should be paying for whatever it is. And as I think we're going to talk about later, there are situations where um, coordination between a waiver program, even if you're using child welfare funds, um, um, can be necessary. And so I should leave that for you. Yeah, well, well I think that we'll, we will cover that later. But just it's, it's a recurring problem, I know. Um, so one uh, Yeah, a couple of, so and we'll talk about a little more later. We have been working in a coalition called the Imagine Different Coalition, where we are getting the assistance of a wonderful uh, woman from Texas named Nancy Rosenau. Um, <laughs> who has um, basically educated us about some things that they've done in Texas. Um, I don't know if there's anybody on the phone here from Texas. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was this notion of a partner family, where the, a family like, let's say, the aunt and uncle in Monique's case, um, could share, essentially share custody in a way. It probably wouldn't be the right word to use, but with another family so that so many kids in our society live in more than one home. 
they go to their mothers on the weekend and their fathers during the week or, or whatever arrangement it is. It's not unusual for kids to live in more than one home. And when you have kids who have very intense needs that, um, you know, basically take up so much of the family's uh, uh, attention and resources, um, it would be incredibly helpful to have two families uh, sharing that. And, and to have that not happen through the child welfare system, although it could, uh, I don't. I don't see any reason why that couldn't necessarily happen, but it doesn't need to happen that way if it could be provided through a waiver or some other um, state program. Um, and in terms of system coordination, again, well, let me just. We have had instances where the, we were able to get a service that existed through a waiver program, but paid for by the child welfare system. Um, and again, I'll talk about that a little more with our other other example. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so, questions for Ginny now about how some of these services and also other services through child welfare might facilitate a placement for Monique um, through the child welfare system. Sure. And as, as Rachel said, I mean, our ideal is to keep a young person out of the system and provide the kind of support that they would need. Um, with with family, like like her aunt, in cases where that's that's not going to occur or it's not occurring yet, um, the child welfare system does have this kind of bottom line obligation to provide placement services and care. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of federal requirements, and then each of you in your states are going to have specific requirements about placement and services. But one of the key ways that we do provide placement for young people in foster care in the most kind of family-like, least restrictive setting is family foster care. And um, that is a setting you all are familiar with. And as Rachel mentioned, I mean, it, it actually appears in a lot of different systems. This idea of you're living with a family. Here we're talking about living with a family that, that has caregiving. Um, family-like responsibilities to a young person, um, but to provide that placement and care. The thing that we did just want to make clear, every state is going to be different, but each of you are going to have a child welfare system that does fund and provide family foster care. And in the majority of cases, how that's going to work is that you're going to have licensing requirements. Families can be licensed, and once they are, a young person can be placed with them. The family provided financial, um, a stipend, um, a per diem to pay for the cost of care. But then the youth also is connected with the child welfare agency, getting case management and other services. When kin um, who are related to a young person, but kin in most of our states has a broader definition, so it doesn't necessarily have to be people that are related, but in this case we do have an aunt and an uncle. Um, in all our states, they can be licensed as foster parents and get the same kind of foster care rate, and we do call that, at least mostly we call that formal kinship care. Um, but another way that states can provide um, more specialized care to young people like Monique who have maybe specialized medical needs or if they have specialized behavioral health needs, they can do that in, in a couple of different ways. Um, state child welfare agencies can definitely create higher rates uh, to, to support specialized placements. And that's something child welfare agencies can do um, without Medicaid dollars. Um, they can do that with their own funds. But another way they can do that is utilizing Medicaid funds to um, provide medical foster care. And we're going to talk that, about that in more detail in one second. But basically, what the child welfare system, though, does give us is a structure to provide um, a whole kind of array of family settings for young people. That is not to say that all of us in our states have the array we want but it is to at least say that the, this structure is available. And um, we'll talk about what it might look like for Monique, but it's also as we get to looking at systemic changes in your systems, knowing that this is some of the raw material you have to work with, but you might be saying to yourself, I don't have these things, or I have them, I have family foster care, but I'm being told there's no specialized foster care and there's no special rates to provide additional care. Um, and so that might be a point of advocacy. Rachel, you want to talk a little bit more about medical foster care? Sure. Um, the way it works in Pennsylvania, and, and I'll also talk a little bit about the way it doesn't work in Pennsylvania. <laughs> 
um, because for all of this, I just have to say, it's not like uh, any of us have solved all these problems. Um, but uh, the Medicaid system pays for the extra care that the foster parents provide that the parents would otherwise provide. So the personal care services that, um, for example, the aunt and uncle would be required to provide on their own because they're home and they are able to do it, um, that's not something most foster parents would be willing to just do um, because they're nice people. Um, so there's an extra rate, and it varies with the level of care that the child needs. Um, but there's an extra rate for the foster families for those additional services. That doesn't mean, shouldn't mean, that the foster family can't get the same Medicaid-funded skilled nursing services and home health aid services and everything else so that they can work and sleep just like another family, non-foster family, would, would do. Um, it's just that they're being paid extra for doing the stuff that, that Monique's parents would do if they were there and able to do it. Um, on the downside, I know, you know, in Pennsylvania, we did a survey once and 37 counties didn't know that it existed. Um, the rates haven't changed. Tell me like how many counties have. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we have 67 counties. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, the rates haven't changed in years. And um, and we've been talking about this with the state for I don't know how long. Um, so it, it, it remains a problem. Um, but it is a structure that can be used. And I think other states have other similar but not identical ways of, of doing medical foster care or therapeutic foster care on the behavioral health side. Okay. Back to Ginny a little yeah. bit for what this might look like sure. in a child welfare placement. Yeah, and so as Rachel mentioned earlier, what Medicaid can provide for, for young people and, and when Rachel was talking about, you're talking about, you know, let's say she never enters care, what could happen when she, if she's Medicaid eligible. Um, and we can look at that same array of services when, when she's in the foster care system. And one thing for you all to note um, is that the almost 100%, but it's not it's not 100, um, but close to 100% of youth in, in the child welfare system are going to be Medicaid eligible. There's very limited exceptions. Um, and those youth will have insurance, but there just might be some, some exceptional situations. But the majority of kids are in child welfare are going to have Medicaid and, and have the, the EPFCT requirement will apply. So any Medicaid-funded services M Monique would be eligible for that she needs. And um, there's often some challenges in child welfare um, with confusion about, you know, if she's denied or if the service is um, reduced, who's responsible for appealing, and we'll talk about that in a little. But she would be eligible for any Medicaid services that are, are medically necessary. And that, that second bullet um, that really she's eligible for any child welfare services that are provided by the agency or that we could come up with and put in, in her case plan. Um, so most of your state child welfare agencies, or if you are also, probably many of you are organized in county systems as well, most of your child welfare agencies will probably have, you know, a core um, group of services that they provide families, that they provide kids, that you'll be able to find out about. But they can also, um, they have a good deal of flexibility to provide services that aren't in their normal kind of core list of services. And often, you know, particularly for individual cases like Monique's, you guys might be, you know, know about a service in the community or a type of service that you think would be good for Monique or, or her family that child welfare doesn't provide, but they might be able to fund it or try to provide it themselves. So you do, what child welfare provides, there is a, a little bit of flexibility there, but you definitely do want to find out about what it is, what's kind of their core services. And then one of the key tools we use as child welfare advocates is that in really all of our states, we have um, juvenile codes that really give our juvenile court judges in child welfare matters a, a huge amount of authority to order that certain services be provided. And so um, there's, I don't want to say that's a simple process, and it does take really making the case for why the service is needed for the youth, but I do want to point that out because that is a pretty extraordinary um, 
resource that we have in the child welfare system. Again, it's not easy and it doesn't mean you get everything you want for a young person and family, but it does mean we have, we are able to turn to the court and make an argument for why a service is needed and if the court orders it, it needs to be provided. So things that Monique needs that aren't like the traditional core services of child welfare, if we're having trouble getting them to her for in other ways, because maybe it's not a Medicaid service, that might be something we could go to the court for. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so what does that mean, just to sort of circle back a little bit, for options for Monique? So we've talked a bunch about a potential kinship placement with the aunt and uncle, which uh, I think we're all in agreement would be the first um, priority here that's uh, you know a, a, an arrangement with somebody that she knows and trusts that are interested in providing for her um, and so there's a lot of creative ways you can structure that using all the different resources that Rachel and Jenny mentioned um, they could potentially become medical foster care providers and get some of the elevated rates for extraordinary services um, that are available um, they could potentially negotiate a higher rate of care for care from the child welfare agency um, and of course, they would be able to be um, to have the same array of medical Medicaid services um, through DSCT provided in their home as, as she would be able, able to receive elsewhere. Um, if for some reason the aunt and uncle, uncle are not an option, so either they're not in the picture or there's something that's not in our fact pattern that makes them not a viable placement for her, um, we, that doesn't mean that we say, well, okay, it looks like she's to stay in the institution, right? We're, there's still an obligation of the child welfare agency to place her in the least restrictive setting possible, and of course, that's echoed in disability law as well. Um, so we consider all those same arrangements, medical foster care with a, with a non-kin, or maybe identifying kin that weren't in that fact pattern, um, specialized foster care provided to the child welfare agency, um, or potentially a collaborative creative arrangement through a Medicaid waiver or other service that could provide um, for a family-based placement funded through multiple systems um, through the child welfare system. Um, so then we're going to turn um, for a few minutes to the nuts and bolts of how to advocate for money. So we've identified a little bit what we're looking for, what we're striving to achieve, um, but how do you do that logistically? And so I'm going to give a few additional facts, and for those who have joined us a little bit um, later in who might not have heard the original fact pattern, I just want to give you the quick um, picture of it. Monique's a 14-year-old. Um, she has spinal mus muscular atrophy, which means she requires a wheelchair, has some seizures, and needs a ventilator at night. She has no cognitive or developmental limitations, but she's been placed by the Child Welfare Agency in an institution for um, older teens and young adults who have, mostly of whom who have serious developmental limitations that are nonverbal. Um, she's close to an aunt and uncle who are interested in her living with them, um, but they would need training and their house is not wheelchair accessible. Um, so the additional facts here, you get a call, this is how the how PNA might get involved, you get a call from her aunt who's really concerned about her. Um, you ask to speak to the child's attorney, um, and the um, aunt says that she's no good, but here's her contact information. Um, and when you speak to the attorney, the attorney seems to think that everything's fine. She's safe. She's, she's, yeah, she's not in harm's way at the moment. Um, but she's open to your ideas, but has no idea what the array of options are, um, and doesn't seem to know her client very well, despite having represented her for the last two years since she's been in care. Um, so first, throwing it to you guys for just a minute, do you have any ideas of what a PNA attorney or advocate might be able to do to, do to help under those circumstances? And you can use your chat feature or your questions feature to just type something in if anything's popping to mind. Well, we'll let you guys think a little bit more. Feel free to chime in as we start covering things, um, if anybody has additional ideas. But I'm going to turn the question uh, over to our panelists here. Um, uh, but actually, oops, I forgot. I'm sorry. Before I do that, I'm going to have Jenny give us an overview, which might prompt some ideas here as you get a sense of the lay of the land in the dependency process. Um, so Jenny, could you tell us a little bit about, um, provide an overview of the dependency process, including who the major players are and what the court process looks like? Sure. And so I'm not going to give you kind of the whole dependency quarter system 101, because that would take a very long time, but we're happy to, to do that with any of you. What we did want to go through for this nuts and bolts was were really kind of, who are the people that are hopefully the helps to you, but often might feel like, like in this case example, like they're in, in your way. <laughs> um, but people, people who are good points of contact and um, intervention for having some some advocacy opportunities and then some forums or opportunities to do that advocacy and 
obviously, as either um, advocates, non-lawyer advocates or lawyer advocates, we do need to kind of address, like, is this young person represented? And in, in the child welfare system, there is no constitutional right to counsel in dependency cases for kids. But the majority of states do have state statutes giving young people some right to counsel. Um, I would, though, you know, the, the caveat to that is that the model of representation for um, young people throughout the country, there, there are a lot of, there are differences. And so um, states are moving towards having more client-directed counsel, even for young people. Um, that's the trend we're going in. But we still do have a lot of states, including ours, Pennsylvania, that has a hybrid model of you are directed by your client, but you also have to represent their best interests. So um, you want to be aware of kind of what system you're working with in your state. Is there a right to counsel and what is the model? If there's not right to counsel for young people, um, the federal law does at least say that there should be advocates for um, kids who are in the child welfare system in those proceedings. So again, kind of understanding who and what you're who's available for young people in your state and what kind of representation um, I think is important because um, you hopefully can work with those people. Sometimes you're working around them to try to make a difference, but you do want to know kind of what you're dealing with. Some states do have um, CASA's court appointed special advocates, and they can be, I think, good allies for you. They have a different role than a, than a lawyer, but often they, um, can be very helpful because they do report to the court about the child's needs and, and how the child is doing. So the, that can be a, an entry point for some advocacy. Um, other parties to know about is um, additionally parents. There's no constitutional right to counsel um, in dependency cases um, for, for parents. Um, and, and sadly, in, in our country, we're even kind of less um, there's, there's less state statutes giving parents right to counsel in dependency cases, although we're definitely moving in that direction. So you do want to know what that looks like in your state, because often, again, they can be great allies and ways to advocate. Um, the state always is represented, and that's, that's the case across the board. So these are kind of our major, um, I think, entry points and hopefully um, entry points where um, we can have some allies. Um, another kind of entry point that's really key in terms of opportunity for advocacy is the federal law does require that the court review um, the cases of kids who are in the dependency in the child welfare system at least every six months. And some states have moved to um, more frequent reviews every three months. And the law is clear, both federal and state law, about all the things the court needs to be looking at at those hearings. And they are very relevant to your advocacy. They have to do with health and well-being, education, as well as being placed in family and permanency. And as, as we mentioned earlier, these hearings are a time for the court to really find out what's going on, make sure things are going well for the young person, the case is moving in the right direction. They are also an opportunity for remedies, for court orders, for things to happen if they haven't. So those are things to have on your radar if you're working on a case and you've figured out some way in, in terms of working with the team, that you really do want to be able to somehow have impact on the court hearing um, if there's things you want done, that that is a good opportunity. And then the case plan is another real um, important forum, I think, for making change in advocacy. The federal law also requires the case plan be updated at least every six months. And similar to the court hearings, there's very clear federal requirements about what has to be in the case plan around permanency, placement with family, as well as health and education. So again, an opportunity if you can um, be involved in some manner um, in making sure the issues that you are flagging um, are paid attention to and that there's some action plan um, to deal with them. So then, Rachel, how might a, a PNA um, or other disability advocate assist in this process that Jenny just described? So if you have uh, an attorney or whoever is working with the child uh, who is not absolutely opposed to you, you know, getting involved, which sometimes happens, and that's a really difficult problem, but assuming you have somebody that's either interested in your help or at least apathetic to it, <laughs> um, 
you have various opportunities, certainly, to educate all of the, the, the caseworkers, the attorneys, the court. Um, I mean, you can go to court with the permission of the attorney who's representing the child. And, and um, I know I, I went to a hearing once where the attorney representing the child, um, basically, when the court asked a question, he just kind of pointed to me and said, her. <laughs> So you know, he, he just wasn't he wasn't interested in really um, doing any any extra work or actually any work he was supposed to be doing to um, to represent her. But he wasn't opposed to um, a, a PNA lawyer stepping in and, and kind of doing some of his job for him. Um, in that case, too, we actually ended up um, negotiating with the with the county's attorney um, instead of him. And um, you know, so you can educate a lot of people in the process in different ways. Um, advocates or lawyers can attend treatment or case planning meetings. We have a lot of advocates in our PNA that do um, go to various kinds of um, planning meetings for kids. Um, you can be a witness to explain to the court what services are available that the court might not know about um, in terms of Medicaid, in terms of waivers, in terms of whatever maybe your county um, intellectual disability or mental health or whatever it is entity has to offer. Um, you can help connect the service systems by contacting you know, all the different sides and giving them each other's information and explaining to each how the other, you know, what each side's part's role is and how they can help each other. Um, you, know, you can do investigation even into um, resources. I mean, sometimes it's just, you know, asking around and saying, do you know a placement um, that might be good, um, that, that we might know about through the disability system rather than through the child welfare system. Um, you can assist with uh, Medicaid denial and, and uh, appeals. Uh, so there's a, a lot of, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of things that, <laughs> that one could do, but there are a lot of places that you can step in if you're allowed to. I have one, there's one question coming in, um, and I, I did see an earlier one that I'm going to get to um, at a point in the presentation where it will, it will fit in nicely, I think, but um, so this question on this point is, what about when the state's attorney objects to your talking to the departmental staff because you're a lawyer, even if you're not serving in a representational role? Uh, which I don't know that there's a clear answer to, but Rachel, do you have any words of wisdom? <laughs> when the state's attorney objects, interesting. We, we, Anyway, um, it's essentially, them objecting to you talking to their client, right? You know, is sort of. So, a, I ha I'm seeing if it's the next slide. Somewhere on a slide here, I have the PNA um, authority. Oh yeah. Well, maybe we can hold this question if you want. It's in the later scenario when we're talking about the sort of more adversarial relationship you might find yourself. Uh, so, but. Uh, but but I think I'm just trying to think this through because we have a right to get information to get records and to talk to the client. That's a little different than talking directly to um, or negotiating. Or negotiating. Well, negotiating would be with the attorney. The win as an, well, I'm functioning as an attorney. It's a little different if you're a lay advocate and what you might be doing. And I, again, I don't know who's on the call or what kind of advocate you're talking about. As an attorney, um, obviously, I would be dealing with the attorneys, not directly with anybody's client. Um, but sometimes our, our um, non-attorney advocates would call the county caseworker or whatever directly. Um, and um, if there was an objection, I have to, have to think about that. I don't know. I well, we can hold, the, we'll circle back. A great credit, yeah. And, and just to, I mean, I think the other thing to, to think about, and, and it is really, I mean, it's frustrating and I think it's time consuming because this is really about trying to work around the fact that the attorney isn't really for the child isn't, isn't doing what you want to do, so or or even what we think is their duty, that it is maybe trying to figure out some other entry points, checking if if you are in a state, like is the parent represented, is is, is that parent's attorney able to um, ask for or, or assert some of the things you um, you would like to, um, and then kind of thinking about if some of those things. Um, again, prepping more people that are on the team to maybe make some of those requests in the case plan. Again, these are not ideal, and I'm really, I'm really adding to the list of things like making your job harder. But I guess it is kind of figuring out these entry points um, 
because unfortunately, like you are educating like tons of people about these systems that, you know, we'll get to some of the systemic reforms. Um, there shouldn't be such a lack of knowledge and, and also like kind of a lack of, um, I think, coordination um, amongst a lot of these agencies and these service systems, but, but there are, so you're often filling in um, some of those gaps. So just to circle, to sort of close the loop and think about this in the context of Monique. So um, with the different services and the different advocacy um, tactics that we've described, there are a number of different scenarios that could look really different for Monique than what the case example describes. So option one, she might have never had injured the child welfare system. You know, as Jenny mentioned, um, there's a responsibility at the outset to make reasonable efforts um, to avoid entry. Of course, you know, she injured because her grandmother passed away, um, but she could have potentially, you know, transferred directly to a place with her aunt and uncle without having to go through this dependency process, especially, um, you know, when it seemed as though she was sort of placed by default into an institutional setting because by virtue of her child replacement. Um, you could work out in a medical foster placement with her aunt, and this is a, a question that we got um, about noting that, yes, there's potential special rates for fostering children with disabilities that can be covered by Medicaid or by intensive foster care payments um, paid from the Child Welfare Agency, and the question is sort of when to use which. And I think, but I will defer to experts, a lot of this will, just, will depend on what's actually available in your area. So the medical foster care enhanced payments are often, they, those are Medicaid payments. The enhanced rate is because of um, because of the, the medical foster care program, program that, that is because the state plan has medical foster care built into it through Medicaid. Um, there might also be availability to have an, an elevated rate, an elevated foster care payment rate provided through federal foster care dollars or state federal state foster care dollars. Um, but this will be a place where you're a little bit, you're somewhat limited by what the array of options are in your area. Is that accurate, Jenny? I think that's true. I mean, and, and we probably even simplified it more than, than it is, which I, I hate to say, but I mean, if, if you kind of look at the array of things, I mean, so medical foster care would be kind of the supplement that's very minor, though, in terms of making a placement work for medical and some some slightly behavioral health. Um, through Medicaid and our behavioral health system, um, at least in Pennsylvania, and I think in many of other states, we do have um, kind of this, what looks like a, a specialized foster home, we call it CRR, foster home. Um, host home, which looks like therapeutic foster care. Now, um, there is less, at least in Pennsylvania, that would give you some equivalent to a CRR host home for medical, um, something more enhanced than medical foster care. So there, I think, some child welfare agencies have, that's where you have child welfare agencies covering a gap that I think is slightly a, a Medicaid gap to some degree, um, except for the waivers. So for us, since we don't have the waivers um, for kids in the child welfare system, our system has, has created some of that to fill the gap, all those Karen said, it's, it's very minor, it's, it's not enough. So some of the choices are about your Medicaid plan, some of the choices are about like how you how you selected your waivers, and then like what gap you, you created in your state. And so I think for most of us, the ideal would be kind of in thinking about future advocacy is like doing that kind of inventory in your state mm -hmm. about do your waivers serve kids in foster care? If they do, how? Which kids? Um, do you have medical foster care? You know, figuring out different ways your state funds things, because some of these are going to be choices you have to make currently based on certain kind of state decisions, but they might be things that could be changed um, through, through advocacy. Um, so I, I do think some will be like they'll have hard and fast answers in your state, but there probably will be things that could be changed if some advocacy um, what was done. So I'm sorry that it's yeah. not like a clear like yes or no, but I do think there's ways to like look at the patchwork and then try to um, figure out kind of what you want to move forward. And when we talk about advocacy more, some of that can really be helped by looking at your data and then comparing the numbers of kids you have and their needs to then what your inventory looks like. And that might give you some fuel for, for pushing on one of those kind of elements of, of, of providing services. And we're, we're going to talk about um, system advocacy again later, but um, one thing I just thought of that we didn't talk about in terms of individual ad advocacy is the complicated question of when you could file a federal lawsuit um, against the county. And, um, you know, certainly if the court has waived
weighed in, you've got a serious problem um, with um, abstention issues and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think there are times beforehand or even things that are solely in the hands of the county agency that it could do or not do where you could um, you could use litigation as, as a, a uh, tool. Yeah. And you well, mean, Rachel, it's asserting an ADA? An yeah. ADA okay. 504 claim, whatever, mm -hmm. yeah, the things that we talked about earlier. Um, but yeah. And I think that what you both are highlighting is a really nice takeaway for Monique's case, which is that there are many options, but none of them are just as clean cut as saying, well, it's this program, right? It's a, it's a matter of matching her needs and the needs of the family that she's looking to live with, with the service array and the funding streams. And so all of the things you see up on this slide and the other ideas people might have, I think, involve overlap an array of different types of services. And, and it, it, um, you know, that would be true at the systems level, too, yeah, taking stock of what your needs are and what the service array is. So we're going to move into the second case example, um, which will um, you'll hear there'll be similar themes, but also some new um, ideas and things we'll be able to talk about in a little bit more depth through this example. Um, so this is Jonathan. Um, he's an 18-year-old, so um, um, now is legally an adult, who's been in the child welfare system since he was a small child. Um, his case file indicates he has PTSD and borderline intellectual functioning. He does not have a clear diagnosis of an intellectual disability. He has spent the last six years in a large institutional placement that houses about 60 children of many different ages in several cottages. Most, but not, not, but not all, are in the child welfare system, and many have intellectual disabilities or severe mental health problems. Jonathan has no identified family resources and rarely leaves the facility's campus. He has a close relationship with several, several staff members of the facility, and he's grown to function really well in that highly structured environment. He excels in his classes at the on-ground school, he works at the on-site flower shop, and he's considered a, quote, model resident by staff. So, um, I'm going to actually, we're, we're running a tiny bit behind on time, so I'm going to skip the issue spotting um, to you guys, although you should still think about what's coming to your radar, but we'll get into that as we, as we talk to Jenny and Rachel about this situation. And this is just a reminder briefly on the slide of the legal tools that we've already talked about. Um, Rachel walked us through the major disability law provisions um, that might be implicated by um, Jonathan's placement setting and his current situation. Um, and of course, the least restrictive, most family-like placement requirement from child welfare law would still govern here. But we're now going to talk about some additional provisions from child welfare law um, that might be helpful in Jonathan's advocacy. So, Jenny, I will turn it over to you. And um, we did uh, our last um, webinar was on permanency and normalcy. So, if you want more information, um, more detail, please do pull that. Um, we'll have to have that recording up. But basically, um, our federal law. You know, the the goal is for kids to um, go home or be placed with, with family, that they're not supposed to grow up in foster care. And um, this right to permanency is something that's in our federal law and then in, in our state laws. And so um, for a young person who is in the child welfare system, we were supposed to make reasonable efforts to prevent removal. But if they are removed, we really should be trying to get them home or in another permanency plan. Um, and permanency under the child welfare law, again, it's really about just finding family for a young person. Um, and most, um, our, our priority is that the legal permanency, that it be, you know, going home, be adoption, but it can also be guardianship, and then um, placement with, with kin, a fit and willing relative, and then our least preferred option, um, APLA, another planned permanent living arrangement. But, um, you know, it kind of hits you right in the face with Jonathan's example. He has been in the system for six years, and at least from the facts, we give you no indication that he's ever been with a family. He's been in an institutional setting. So it would kind of hit you in the face that it's really hard to believe that we follow the law in his case um, if we follow this obligation to, um, to find permanency for him. And so we have really found that what, when we look at who is getting stuck kind of lingering in the system and who is getting stuck with either that least preferred goal of APLA, um, it really is older um, young people and young people with disabilities. And what we're, we're told, whether they're facts or myths, is that we can't find places for these young people because the services are too costly um, and, or that it's too costly to keep them home. Um, we find that youth are very early on labeled as unadaptable um, when we really know that that's not that that's not true. But that is kind of the some assumptions that are made that really do um, 
what follows is kind of bad practice after you make those assumptions. And then also confusing placement with permanency. Um, in, in, you know, the most traditional sense, if you're going to be um, living with and having a family, you live with them, but in not in all cases. Um, there can be ways that you can be placed in um, a certain setting, but your family and your, your family network may not live with you. So that's something that we um, really do want to consider. However, um, we definitely think regardless of whether you're living with family or not, that you should be living in the community. And then so in terms of kind of achieving permanency, there's a lot of opportunities for advocacy. And the law has actually strengthened in the last couple of years to really make it so there should be few young people um, who have this permanency plan of APLA. And we really do think that, unfortunately, that um, probably we're still going to face a struggle with kids who are over 16 and have disabilities. But we really want to use the law because the law is telling us very few kids, if any, should be stuck in this APLA category anymore. And the couple of reasons why that is is, one, it's prohibited for any youth under 16. There's no exception for whether you have a disability or a special need. Any youth under 16. Um, should have those four more preferred permanency plans, like adoption, reunification, et cetera. If you are going to have the permanency plan of APLA, the law has changed to make it much harder for you to get there. So you really do have to show why it's appropriate, and you have to show why you've tried everything um, possible to avoid this permanency plan. And so again, if you want um, more detail on the new law, please let us know. Please look at that webinar. But the bottom line is, if you're seeing cases where people are just telling you, oh, it's an APLA case, we're not doing anything about it, that's a red flag to really look at what's happening um, with that case and, and are they really following the law and is that a point of intervention to request more services for this young person um, to put in um, more efforts to find them family. And just to reiterate um, for this audience, that APLA is another planned permanent living arrangement. Um, it's, it's a child welfare term, as Cindy mentioned, in the hierarchy. Um, and there definitely are a bunch of things that have actually been in the law for, for several years that really are incentives to help kids find permanency. Um, we really do prefer that kids be placed with relatives, so the, the law really um, does require that we be notifying relatives. Um, with the hope that they can support the family or um, potentially be a placement resource. Um, we have a legal requirement to make reasonable efforts to place siblings together. We know from young people how important that, that sibling bond is, and we do think that a lot of youth in institutions and in group care really um, aren't getting the benefit of this provision of the law, and I, I think it is important to make sure that's enforced. Um, we do have some financial incentives to permanency, so um, if young people are adopted or enter guardianship um, at, at 16 or older, um, they can have extended subsidies um, if, if they are adopted or in guardianship. And um, our state, Pennsylvania, went a little further and, and, and said adoption to guardianship at 13 can continue subsidies until 21. So again, that helps provide more support to a family that wants to achieve permanency with a young person but might be a little reluctant to, use, to lose financial um, support. Um, we also now do have um, the Medicaid program provides um, health insurance, Medicaid, to young people who are in foster care at 18 until 26. And then there's a bunch of um, financial supports that kind of play out through um, financial aid and higher education both education and training voucher, and then the status of an independent student on the FAFSA, the financial aid form. So again, um, if you're interested in our, our, our encountering cases where you want to learn more about these incentives, please email us. There might be some variations in your state, but at least know that things like financial incentives um, help with higher education and maybe some um, supportive services as kids age out might be things you can tap on to help support a family that wants to move to permanency with a young person but is afraid of losing services. Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> Does guardianship in this context mean guardianship of a child or is this related to long term? So, yeah, that's a good point. So, um, 
guardianship is probably going to look a little different or the term you use in your state, but guardianship is, we're not talking about in, um, competency or incompetency. We are talking about um, a custodial arrangement between a parent-like person and a child. Um, we look at it as something um, that is a little less permanent than adoption, but the difference in why it has been a nice hybrid option for, for families is that it doesn't require termination of parental rights. Um, and so often guardianship might be an option for a kinship arrangement that wants to have the child and system involvement, but doesn't want to terminate the biological parents' rights. So yes, and that's a good point because I know for you guys at PNAs, you're all often working on guardianship of um, situations. We're not talking about an adult. We are talking about um, a legal arrangement between someone who serves as a parent over a minor child. Great question. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. And then a lot of, we've done a lot of sessions on transition planning, but we did just want to remind you that transition planning, there's an obligation in the child welfare system. And so that is, a service that you can tap into, but it's also something that can play out in terms of like service provision and support for a young person and a family. Um, and, and again, um, the transition services must begin at 4, 14, but then planning for the discharge um, must occur um, at least 90 days, but a lot of states, including ours, requires the, the planning begin a lot earlier than the 90 days, but really requiring some kind of discharge plan. Um, and we can, maybe we should move. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's a lot of detail we can get into in transition planning. The point really here and why we're putting it in the context of this presentation on least restrictive setting is, as Jenny mentioned, that it's, an, it's a, a way to achieve services that might facilitate um, either a, a family-based placement, a, a deinstitutionalization, or, um, or once a child is leaving the foster care system, the ability to um, not remain institutionalized. So for somebody like Jonathan, um, transition planning is a really key component to ensuring that he doesn't stay in an institutional type setting after he leaves the foster care system. Um, and then the final. Yeah. And so this is just a, a reminder. We mentioned earlier that um, there definitely are federal and, and then state child welfare law requirements about um, making sure that the child welfare agency is monitoring and providing for a child's um, health needs. And so the state must have a system um, about health, health care oversight and coordination, and you can ask your state for that. Um, I will tell you many are fairly um, basic and really just say, you know, our plan to oversee health care is to oversee it. Um, but you definitely should ask for it, and I might have, uh, I might be exaggerating a bit, but I, I don't know that you're going to be terribly impressed when you request those plans, but they're worth looking at, and they have, again, been points of advocacy um, and discussion about system coordination and oversight. But there's also individual um, kind of case planning requirements about monitoring and planning for a child's health care needs. And then many states, and ours is one of them, have specific court rules that really do require that the court make findings about health and special needs, which again is this way to have a little bit of a check on whether they're the appropriate care is provided, and it also gives you an opportunity to ask for orders if the finding is that people aren't able to respond about what the needs are, or if something has occurred, or if, if something has just popped up as a new issue that, that there needs to be some kind of judicial response. So what does this mean for Jonathan? So, um, and he, you know, he's in this institutional setting, um, he's uh, got a diagnosis of PTSD, but it's unclear what other needs he has, you know, what should we be thinking about in terms of placement and permanency for Jonathan? Um, and first I should note that just because Jonathan is 18 um, and we're obviously thinking about what's going to happen after child welfare in uh, involvement does not do anything to lessen the legal requirements that Jenny mentioned earlier regarding permanency. He still has a right to permanency. The child welfare system still has the same obligation to help him achieve permanency. Um, you know, the conversation will look different, and I have, I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth. You know, it, you know obviously he has a large role to play in, in articulating what he would like in that realm, um, but nothing has changed about the legal obligation. And so the fact that he has no identified family resources right now 
does not mean that the child welfare system can say, well, we tried and we failed there, so what's the next thing? They've still got an obligation to look for resources. There might be um, non-biological relatives who could provide permanency, um, people that he's developed relationships with, and different states have different services to help facilitate and locate those relationships, and those are you know, people in Jonathan's past who might be um, useful resources, but there's an op but there, there usually are some array of, of sort of tools to help um, the foster care agency um, help identify and cultivate those and relationships. And one, one thing, just, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but, um, the, the slide we went through really quickly, <laughs> I think what we did neglect to say is that, you know, that is true because we place Jonathan in a state where there is extended foster care. Oh, right. um, so about two-thirds of our states do allow kids to stay in the child welfare system uh, past age 18. Um, and that's definitely something um, you want to make, you know, check in to see where your state is. You can email us and we can tell you if you're not sure. But what that means for Jonathan, if he's, for example, in Pennsylvania, is all, as Karen said, all of these legal obligations for permanency, for transition planning, for monitoring health and well-being, and the obligation to provide placement, those all remain intact for, for, um, for Jonathan. Great point, Jenny. Yes, thanks for highlighting that. And, and a key point to mention there actually is that um, there are different states have different eligibility requirements potentially for remaining in extended foster care. The federal law that has enabled these programs, um, um, it, one of the there's there's a requirement. You know, you could be in school, you could be working. You know, various ways you could satisfy the extended care eligibility. One of them includes if you have a disability that makes you unable to meet one of those other requirements. Um, and so many, perhaps most states have embedded that category in there. Was that? I don't know. Well, no, there's, there's a couple of states who. Um, haven't, but um, are working toward are working it. Toward it. And there are some states that have gone above and beyond. I know, for example, Florida um, actually has extended foster care through age 22 for individuals who have a disability. And so it is important to know what your specific state law says um, in that regard. But yes, we're presuming that Jonathan is now able to leave the system. He could decide to sign himself out and, and um, not stay in care. Many young people do for many different reasons. Um, but he is entitled um, to the child welfare services um, that he had all the way along um, if he's choosing to remain in care. Um, his, the placement obligations also don't change. We're still, there's still an obligation to provide the least restrictive setting. Um, this, is, this slide demonstrates kind of the array of possible settings that might be possible through the child welfare system. Obviously, several of these are highly non-preferred, including the one he's currently in, that's in an institutional setting. We have highlighted some that might be viable options for him that could help him um, not only gain better uh, sort of independent living skills and, and things through living in the community, but also cultivate the relationships that could help them achieve permanency. Um, so these are all sort of family-based or community-based options of foster care, medical or therapeutic foster care, as we discussed earlier. And then one thing to think about for Jonathan is, is supervised independent living, which is another um, supported arrangement where a young person might live in their own apartment or in an apartment with a roommate, um, but still have um, a degree of support. And it looks different depending on the different models. but. Um, to still be still be part of the child welfare system and still have day-to-day um, -day support from adults, um, so it's not that they're just out on their own. Um, and just a thing to remember about um, supervised independent living is that accommodations um, have to be provided if necessary in those settings as well. So um, the same disability law provisions that we discussed earlier would apply even if we're talking about a young person living in their own apartment as opposed to with a foster family or a kinship arrangement. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we are still thinking about permanency, um, and it's still it's it's absolutely still a legal requirement. But it can be a, a challenging and difficult conversation to have with adolescents. You know that there are many young people in Jonathan's situation might be resistant to the notion of being adopted, or when asked the question, say, you know, no, I'm not, I don't want that. Um, but what we'd encourage is to unpack the initial no, to really think about why someone um, might be saying that, and to remember that that regardless of what we're calling it. Um, you know, all people need family, and that that's no less true for an adolescent than it is for a, a younger child or, or even for an adult. And so um, continuing to identify who Jonathan's family will be remains really central to his case planning. Um, so what options might exist for Jonathan outside of the child welfare system? I'm going to turn to Rachel for this one. Well, so in this case, we don't know initially whether he has an intellectual disability or not. That's going to be a really important thing to find out. Um, obviously, if he has an intellectual disability, there is at least a strong likelihood that there might be a waiver program that could provide him a home, um, either with a family, some type of life sharing arrangement, or in a small community home with staff, um, generally through waivers. Um, 
can I interrupt you for just yeah. one second to, to just explain actually that th this may be something that you guys are familiar with, but it's very common in our experience for young people to present like Jonathan, where he's got something that is short of, a, of an actual diagnosis of an intellectual disability, but um, potentially the child welfare system has been treating him, uh, assuming that he has that diagnosis, but never got the right testing, or you know, perhaps he doesn't, but he's being treated as though he does. So this sort of ambiguity is, is, a, is by design here, and it's something that we find to be fairly common to young people in the child welfare system. So, um, yeah, and that's a whole, I mean, yeah. unfortunately, I don't think we have enough time to really get into how, how to deal with um, proving that, if necessary, and other issues. But um, collaboration and coordination is essential in the sense that um, if he's going to be in the child welfare system from 18 to 21, but he's going to need an ongoing placement after he's 21 because he has an intellectual disability um, and is likely to be able to get a waiver at that future date, you don't want to place him somewhere when he's 19 or 20 where he's going to have to move a year later to a different family or a different home. And so we've really tried to get the systems to work together so that, for example, um, we've had a couple of cases where uh, someone in those years uh, was able to find a home that was identified through the intellectual disability system where he would be able to stay past his 21st birthday, but make the child welfare system pay for it until he's 21. Um, and um, that has, in some cases, required going to court and explaining to the court why that's important. And because, I don't know, in Pennsylvania, it seemed clear that, that the ID system paid more money than the child welfare system. Um, another case we had, the issue was licensing. Um, there were rules that the home had to be licensed as a foster care home. and the resource we found was licensed otherwise um, through the adult disability system. And those kinds of things, uh, I mean, we're still trying to get the state to have some kind of memorandum of understanding so that those things go smoothly, and they don't. Um, but, but that would be the goal. Um, if he doesn't have uh, an intellectual disability diagnosis, um, it, it's a lot harder. I mean, there are these things. There's, social, there's SSI. There's Vocational rehab, that can be very helpful. Of course, the education system, Medicaid, APSDT would continue. Um, there may be services in the mental health system for PTSD that are beyond what Medicaid provides when, for when he's over 21, and maybe his Medicaid options are more limited. Um, but it, it's really hard to, I mean, those are the hardest cases, I think, the kids that don't fit into um, any kind of waiver system that we would have available but still have significant issues that would make it very difficult for them to really succeed on their own. Um, well, and part of what, you know, when we find these cases, and as Karen said, like, we, we do see more of these cases than we should of kids who've really been kind of forgotten about um, in some of these more restrictive placements, but it wasn't really clear what their what their needs were. And in those cases, Rachel said, we don't have a lot to work with in terms of what their discharge plan is. But we do, you know, you, you then really jump into gear, really trying to make sure if they weren't in this placement worried about kind of the skill development and those kinds of things that you start doing more of that advocacy. It should have happened years and years ago, but this is often, um, it, again, you know, something that reforming our system so our data was better um, and we could flag cases earlier for either an inappropriate placement or not understanding a disability would help with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are cases we encourage you to look out for because um, they really do have, leave kids kind of falling in, in, a, in a big gap. So yeah, as that Jenny's points are really demonstrated here when we try to come up with what the options are for Jonathan. And these don't look very much like what we came up with for, for Monique, where it's like, okay, here's the family, here's how we get the support in place. For Jonathan, things needed to have begun a lot earlier. But at the same time, here's where we are now, and this is not uncommon. And so, you know, the, it's kind of point A is to get supports in place as soon as possible to transition him out of his current placement, where he's really, I think, at a point where he's no longer developing. He, he's exhausted most of their programs. He's, he's sort of been there for so long that it's hard to know what life in the community would be like for him. Um, obviously, getting an understanding of his diagnosis so we can figure out what services he'd be eligible for, figuring out what supportive relationships are going to be there for him, both for the purpose of legal permanency and also just to have it so when he's out on his own, he has somebody to call that can help him work through things, you know, regardless of whether it's a legal permanency arrangement. Um, and then we need to work on the types of 
um, skills, employment op options, um, independent living skills that would make it possible for him to live in a community environment for his discharge, both because um, he, we want that for him to be able to live in the community and also because he may not be eligible for any type of institutional placement once he leaves. So sometimes there's an expectation by the child welfare agency that he'll be able to continue in the same type of living arrangement he's in now and there be, may be no possibility for funding of an equivalent type thing, which means that he might be looking at a real possibility of homelessness. Um, and so we're in a pretty urgent situation with Jonathan, but you know, as Rachel highlighted, there are services that are available and the child welfare obligations remain the same. So um, we have about five minutes left and we want to spend a few minutes talking about um, some systems level advocacy, but I think maybe we can devote just a little bit to what's different about advocacy strategies for Jonathan. And um, the facts here in terms of you know how might you get involved, um, here just you're, you're reaching out to his attorney and the attorney is much more adversarial, is much less interested in your ideas, thinks everything is fine, doesn't see the harm um, in where he is. Um, and so I think maybe we've talked a little bit about transition planning. And is, there, yeah. is it okay if we jump to the sure. sort of um, yeah. how can a PNA become involved in this process? And if you have questions um, about sort of extended foster care, what the process looks like when you're over 18, um, you know, more details about the dependency system, don't hesitate to reach out to us about it. But I want to spend a moment talking about how to advocate for Jonathan <laughs> if you're a PNA. Yeah. So this is the slide we looked at before. All of these things have become harder. Um, let's do the next slide. Yeah, there we go. I, I pulled out some of the um, PNA uh, authority things through the DD Act um, because one of the things I wanted to point out, and I don't know if this is really Jonathan, but there is a provision that says if um, if someone um, is in the custody, if the state is their legal guardian, then if you have a complaint, you don't need anyone's permission essentially to get their records. So there's some extra help you can get um, in, in terms of accessing things for kids that are in the child welfare system. Um, in this case, he's 18, so you could get his permission um, as well. And the problem here is that it is not, you know, what our, what our um, P&A authority grants us, but the legal ethics, if you're an attorney, of interfering with another attorney's client. And so you really do have to try to work with that lawyer and find a way to get that lawyer to recognize that there's a problem. Um, I know in one case, you know, we sent an email saying that we believed that the, the client was being emotionally abused and that caught that lawyer's attention and she responded with, well, I wouldn't go that far, but she did start to, do, to, to listen to us and, and take some action. Um, um, there may be some room for non-lawyers, as I said earlier, to um, certainly to get information. That shouldn't be a problem because of these, these rules, but, um, and to talk to the, to the youth. Um, but uh, but it is, it's a tricky area. Um, and I think, Rachel, you did have a case where, I mean, the, the other difference is with an 18-year-old, he could ask for other representation, but as Rachel said, you know, it's just the tricky thing of, you know, what your role as an attorney is in facilitating you know, someone else who's represented is kind of firing and asking for, for another attorney, but definitely want to note that with the, the, the change and that then this per, the young person is a legal adult, and so there might be more leverage. I mean, the other challenge we have is that um, in our systems of representation for kids and dependency, if the young person does ask for a new attorney, um, will someone else be appointed? Who else will represent him? And that may not be an issue in a case of if a PNA wants to represent them in a dependency matter, but they may not want to represent them in a dependency matter, they might want to provide assistance to an attorney who's doing that. So more room when he's 18, but still things to think about. <laughs> and if sure. any of you have answers to those problems, yeah. Yeah. I'd love, <laughs> love to hear them. So just for a brief moment, um, many uh, systems level or policy barriers to effective advocacy for these young people have been mentioned through this presentation. Um, over and over we've talked about the lack of coordination among service, service systems, um, failure to um, have permanency planning for kids in facilities on sort of systems level, um, lack of supportive services, lack of medical foster care um, placements, and you know, I'm sure there's more that you could come up with as well. Um, so I'm going to combine the question, and you each have 30 seconds um, about what recommendations or what, like, what, how you'd like might like to see a PNA advocate for reforms in this area. Um, so I'm going to have this slide up, but either if you, you maybe I'll turn to Jenny first, yeah. or what your, yeah, sort of recommendations are and how you'd like to see PNA support, and then we'll see. We'll have uh, Rachel time in as well. 
Um, well, I mean, really, I think um, really trying to intervene in some of these individual cases is so important. But I do think it, there's so many policies that need to be put in place that um, PNAs are in a good position to explain kind of why they are best practice, but also why they make fiscal and other sense. So um, some advocates are, you know, reduction of primary care and group care is something that Karen said a lot of child welfare advocates are working on. I think um, PNA advocates can add so much to those efforts, not just the lead, lead, additional legal underpinnings, but just showing people how it can work. Um, and and I think I think also helping advocates come up with. Um, aspects of transition planning policies that would be implemented statewide, countywide, that really can streamline how some of these cases are handled, that you guys have a lot of the expertise to kind of help people um, bring that other that other half of the, the, the coordination um, that needs to be in these transition planning protocols. And we're happy to help. If those are things you're interested in doing and you want kind of a little more discussion or thinking about what that might look like, we're, um, we're happy to do that. Data, um, Rachel's going to talk about, but I think really showing and asking child welfare agencies for data is so important because we're so underutilizing, I think, in child welfare, um, how we're collecting data, not just to see how we're doing for youth with disabilities, but also using data to help people plan better for, the, for these young people. Yeah. So. Um, Again, the slide shows, you know, examples of all the kinds of education and training that we can do. I mean, there's just tons of places and things we could do trainings on. Um, we have to be careful about lobbying, but you can do education for legislators and policymakers um, about these issues. Uh, you can work with coalitions. Um, provider agencies is interesting because there are some provider, like big institutional provider agencies that are actually interested in moving to a different type of a different way of serving their clients, and so bringing them into the process can be good at times. Um, we've done right to no requests. It's very hard to get um, good data, um, but and of course, ultimately, you could do systemic litigation. Um, we've been working with a coalition I mentioned earlier. The Imagine Different Coalition um, that has a lot of different. Um, advocates and families and even even um, government people that have been involved um, that has provided some some really good they have wonderful materials and we have managed to get to the table at least where we have bi-monthly meetings with all of the uh, deputy secretaries and all the you know child welfare and medical assistance and uh, intellectual disabilities and all the different offices every two months to talk about what they're doing to get kids out of facilities both in child welfare and not um, and we'll see if it really goes anywhere. There have been so many strategies of, of you know, committees and things that have not gone anywhere. Um, but uh, I encourage you to look up the Imagine Different um, the material that's on their website because um, they've just got some really, really helpful stuff. Um, and this question will have to be for you guys to send to us later if you have great strategies. But we'd love to hear from you about um, both systems level and individual advocacy, what has worked um, to really help child welfare clients who have special health care needs or disabilities um, uh, end up in a, in a living environment and a permanency arrangement that can truly meet their needs. So thank you so much for joining us today. Here is all of our contact information. As I mentioned, the webinar is being recorded, and we will um, make that link available as well as the other um, webinars in this series. But please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us um, for further ideas, questions, um, or opportunities for collaboration. As Denny mentioned, we would, we would love to um, speak with you about any of those things. So thank you, um, and I uh, hope you'll tune into our next one on July 11th.